Like so many of his brother Primarchs, Rogal Dorn had seized a warrior's destiny long before his reunification with the Emperor. Adopted into the ruling families of the Inuit system, his talent for discipline and order had expanded that star-flung dominion's boundaries further than anyone had before him. He had a mind appreciative not just of metal and machinery, but also the flesh and blood that must wield such tools in matters of war. Furthermore, Dawn was possessed of a stalwart idealism that melded perfectly with the Emperor's Great Crusade and equipped him well for leadership of the fledgling 7th Legion. The Imperial Fists soon became the Emperor's Praetorians, a duty they discharged with honour on worlds beyond count as the Great Crusade wore on. From the first, they proved masters of the bloody work of siegecraft. Under their Primarch's guidance, they raised and broke fortifications like no other force, safeguarding the nascent Imperium with an ever-expanding curtain wall of fortress worlds and deep space bastions. To Dawn's calculating eye, the Imperium was a fortress and Terra its central citadel. Mankind's far-flung worlds were more than dominions to be reclaimed, they were vital ramparts in a growing hole that Dawn envisioned as the Bastion Imperialis, and owed service as readily as they were owed protection in return. As a result, few felt the betrayal of the Horus heresy more deeply than the brooding Rogal Dawn. Each world that plunged into rebellion cracked the foundation of the immortal fortress he had laboured to build. Even before the outbreak of the Horus heresy, Dawn had been recalled by the Emperor to fortify the birthworld of humanity. The Praetorian of Terror was one of the Emperor's greatest assets during the Age of Darkness and especially during the Siege of Terror. For his incredible mind, along with the defences installed by the 7th Legion, delayed the traitor forces long enough for reinforcements to arrive. The time for speeches is done. The first great test is here. My order to you all is simple, yet heed it well, and exert yourselves to see it done. They are coming. Kill them all. However, during the latter stages of the Horus Heresy, and in the scouring afterwards, terrible evils would befall the Seventh Legion and their Primarch. For in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. I love Rogal Dawn. You love Rogal Dawn, probably. He's a pretty hard character not to enjoy. And I think the reason for that is because he is probably the most consistently well-written Primarch that we get in the Heresy. If you look at his journey compared to someone like the Lion, then someone like Lehman Russ, he's so consistent in how he approaches his problems. He's an understandable character. He's very human at times. He needs to take breaks during the Siege of Terror. There are these scenes where he kind of goes to this garden and will dwell on things. And when he does defeat his foes, he does it in a really interesting way. One of the things that makes Dawn so interesting is the fact that he actually basically takes out two traitor Primarchs during the latter Horus Heresy and Siege of Terror. They are Alpharius and Fulgrim. The reason that's so interesting is because you wouldn't typically put Rogal Dawn as one of the best Primarchs in terms of fighting. However, when he beats them, again, it's just kind of through great writing. He beats them through his tactical acumen. He beats them through exploiting their weaknesses. So when he fights against Alpharius, we see that he actually understands his brothers probably more than any other Primarch. And he understands why he is the Praetorian and what it is to have that role. And so he can instantly kind of pick Alpharius out amongst his legions, which, of course, most of the Primarchs typically can do. When he fights against Fulgrim, he exploits Fulgrim's arrogance. And he, Fulgrim actually attacks the Imperial Palace with the Emperor's children kind of all at once. And Rogal Dawn says to Sanguinius later, you know, I probably can't beat Fulgrim in a straight fight, but I know that I can fight him to a degree that he will then turn and run. So Rogal Dawn is a really great character to follow. And I'm pretty sure he's one of the favorite Primarchs when it comes to Black Library authors. 
And it's also worth noting that everybody on the loyalist side and the traitor's side during the Siege of Terror is kind of full of nothing but compliments for Dawn. It's regularly said that if he was on the traitor side, the traitors probably would have won. Sanguinius, Vulcan, Jagatai, they all note multiple times that realistically, he probably had the greatest impact out of any Primarch. And the Emperor certainly seems to have a huge amount of trust in Dawn that he doesn't really seem to have for any of the other Primarchs. However, if you were thinking this is just going to be a, a, a session where I gush about how amazing Rogel Dawn is, unfortunately, that's not going to be all this stream is. So we are going to go on today and have a look at the end of Rogel Dawn's storyline from what we know and how it is completely different to this incredible stalwart and legendary character that seems to make no mistakes throughout the heresy. And... Now, interestingly, in the End of the Death Volume 2, it appears that we have a good explanation of why Dawn seems to make catastrophic errors in the scouring, given that during the Horus Heresy, it's just nothing but net from the big guy. So we're going to take a strong look at what happens to Dawn when he teleports onto the Vengeful Spirit, along with the Emperor and Sanguinius. This is known as the Anabasis Assault. And when they teleport on, they are immediately split up. This was always kind of the old law that they didn't all approach the throne room together. However, now we have a lot of detail on what happens to Rogel Dawn. So one really interesting thing to note is that Horus Lupercal actually had a plan for Dawn in his new Imperium. He also had plans for Sanguinius, the Emperor, and Constantine Valdor. He actually wanted to make a new Mornival. The Mornival were the senior members of the Sons of Horus, or Lunar Wolves, who advised Horus during the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy. We explore this topic to a great degree in Horus Rising and the early Horus Heresy books. And throughout the Horus Heresy, various members leave the Sons of Horus, or they are killed. And so Horus decides he's going to make a new Mornival, and now he's going to have it that each member of the Mornival will represent one of the four Chaos Gods. So he has a plan where the Emperor will represent Slanesh. He will be like an avatar of Slanesh within the Mornival, which is sounds crazy, but the logic given is that the Emperor has been, you know, planning things for tens of thousands of years. And so realistically, he's probably going to want to take a step back and chill out for a little bit. So he's going to be the avatar for Slanesh. Valdor is a person who's been kind of, you know, custodians are kind of, uh, uh, they have very little free will realistically. And so Valdor would be a representative of Zeech on the Mornival. Sanguinius will be a representative of Nurgle because, of course, he's foreseen his death. So that eternal life aspect would be really appealing to him. However, most people thought Sanguinius would surely be an avatar of Corn because the blood angels are all about ripping and tearing. Let's be real. However, actually, the avatar for Corn in Horus's plan was going to be Rogel Dawn. And it's really hard not to notice how those two things rhyme. So Rogel Korn is absolutely a plan of the Chaos Gods. So after Rogel Dawn teleports onto the Vengeful Spirit, or what he thinks is the Vengeful Spirit, he actually ends up in a desert. There is rusting brown everywhere. It's described as it's described as like a red desert, and he is taunted by a being who is referred to as the Red, or he refers to as the Red. And we probably think this is going to be corn or at least some sort of representative of corn and as rogaldorn walks throughout this desert he is constantly told to say blood for the blood god essentially as rogaldorn crosses the desert the red constantly asks like blood for the who who is the blood for and the idea is that if rogaldorn will finally say blood for the blood god he will give in. But every time he gets close, his sanity reasserts himself and he keeps repeating the same line, you know, I am Rogel Dawn. And he you know, has to keep reminding himself of who he is. And it's said that this scene actually goes on for centuries from Rogel Dawn's point of view. Now, admittedly, this is when time has absolutely gone to hell. 
but certainly it's a, a ridiculous time frame to be trapped in a desert. And as Rogel Dawn kind of goes through the desert, he finds this huge wall that he can't get through. And obviously there's a lot of symbolism here because Rogel Dawn is very famous for being a Primarch who's exceptional at siege craft and uh, siege warfare. However, he can't get over this wall and he keeps coming up with plans for how to get over the wall, battle plans, etc., etc. He screws them onto the wall. You can actually see on the wall there that as he's coming up with these plans he is writing them down and the red keeps getting really annoyed by this there's this really funny scene where as corn is trying to taunt the primarch of the imperial fists he says to dawn he's like who's the blood for who's the blood for and then rogel dawn remembers this like lesson he'd had from the emperor long ago where the emperor had told him about an ancient battle and that there was ethics to warfare introduced and rogel dawn gives like a lecture to corn despite the fact he knows corn won't listen about the ethics that should exist within warfare and it said that the red is getting increasingly annoyed by this because Rogel Dawn just will not relent. The Primarch of the Imperial Fists does not give in. And he does it again. He keeps giving these lectures to the Blood Guard and explaining, like, you know, the, the, the tactics of siege warfare, etc. But Rogel Dawn can't technically actually win. He has no way of getting out of this fortress. As Dawn continues walking through the desert, he does notice that there's not much left of his blade and everything is starting to rust. Even his incredible armor has started to rust. He does discover armor of the Seventh Legion. He's starting to forget even what the Seventh Legion was. He can't even remember what he's doing here. He doesn't really remember the Horus Heresy. He remembers like that there was some sort of big battle, but it's just been such a long time. Even a Primarch is starting to lose his faculties. And all along, periodically, Corn will just kind of jump out and from, from various distances whisper and say, give in, give up, let go, just say it. Say blood for the blood god. But Rogel Dawn believes in the imperial truth and he says there are no gods, not even you. He says that to Corn, not to his face, but as close as you can get to Corn and say it. So you may be wondering how does Rogel Dawn ever get out of the desert? And he gets out of the desert largely as a consequence of the emperor so as we've talked about in previous streams quite a few times now throughout the end and the death whilst this is going on the emperor is ascending to godhood he's becoming the dark king and when the emperor is convinced to relinquish this godhood and he lets go of it there's a huge psychic shockwave that is sent out and it affects people all across terror, all across the vengeful spirit. Everyone can feel it. Chaos demons start celebrating when they hear it because they suddenly come to the conclusion, as, as the chaos gods planned, that this is the emperor relinquishing the only power he could possibly have that could beat the war master. However, the other effect of this shockwave is to weaken the grasp that Korn has over this realm. And so the wall starts to weaken. And Rogel Dawn starts just punching the wall. He punches his hands completely bloody. But eventually he does get through the wall and into the inevitable city. And if you think it's uh, going to be a lovely reunion with the Imperial Fist who joined him when teleporting onto the Vengeful Spirit... Quickly, he actually discovers that every single member of his legion who teleported onto the Vengeful Spirit with him is now dead. They all died uh, fighting against traitors. He actually kind of follows the battle and he understands like who was the last to die. And he actually picks up one of their great swords, the great sword of his Huskar, who you know died fighting as the, the last Imperial Fist on the Vengeful Spirit. And Dawn actually, you know, picks up this weapon and is going to use it now to fight back against the traitors. And Rogel Dawn actually decides to re-enter the fight, as it were. And so we don't actually know what he's going to do going into the final book because Rogel Dawn has essentially spent centuries being tortured. His actual Primark weapon is broken. He's now got this great sword, but also narratively. I'm really interested to see what they do with Dawn in this final book because the Emperor, Loken, and Kaikautus, and Litu, they're fighting against Horus. 
Valdor is about to take on Abaddon. So who is left for Rogel Dawn? My brain immediately jumps to Erebus. Erebus is probably the last significant Chaos Marine left on the Vengeful Spirit. Perturabo himself is like long gone. Um, potentially there'll be a, a demon summoned maybe that will fight against Rogel Dawn. But um, yeah, I'm really interested to see what they do there. It's also worth noting that the last time we see Rogel Dawn in the book, he actually rescues the witch Acte, who has uh, and really to do really needs to do a video on her at some point. She has a very long backstory into the Horus Heresy. She is the Blessed Lady of the uh, Wordbearers. If you've ever read First Heretic, she's actually brought back to life by Erebus and becomes a perpetual. Goes on this huge journey. She controls the Alpha Legion and she actually duels against Erebus in the second uh, end of the Death novel. So it, she has this huge storyline and she has seemingly been watching over Dawn whilst he's been in this desert. It's kind of implied because she immediately responds to Dawn. And when Dawn says, do you know who I am? She says the phrase to him that Dawn's been repeating to himself over and over again to keep his sanity, which is, I am Rogel Dawn, seventh found Primarch, Primarch of the Imperial Fists, etc., etc. She says that exact phrase. And it looks like Malkador has been watching Dawn all along as well um serene yes yeah, the name of the character if when she's in first heretic but the really interesting thing is that you're probably watching right now and going like okay so dawn actually kind of beats chaos in this respect he's kind of fine at this point in time and to be fair he seems to be pretty with it right he definitely seems like he's about to rejoin the fight as it were however the reason i think that this has probably had a much greater effect than the book is initially let on is because of the iron cage now the iron cage is very old warhammer 40k lore and it is rogel dawn's greatest mistake it is one of the greatest mistakes that any of the primarchs make and he nearly loses all of his sons so certainly after the horus heresy rogel dawn is grieving for his father he actually finds the emperor's body he takes the emperor's body back to the throne room we can only assume that the emperor imparts some sort of wisdom into dawn we see malkador do a similar thing in the end of the death volume one and it was always said that the emperor imparts the knowledge of how people should kind of maintain and update the golden throne now that he's about to be interred so rogel dawn goes through a lot but ultimately rogel dawn ends up being completely broken as you'll see in this passage here The one real triumph in the period following the Horus Heresy was the reason for Perturabo's ascension to the rank of Demon Prince. The Iron Warriors had been close to breaching the defences of the Imperial Palace, but had abandoned the siege before Horus's fall. Afterwards, their empire was dismantled by the Imperial Fists by virtue of overwhelming superiority of numbers. However, on Sebastus IV, Perturabo would set a trap for their Primarch by building the self-styled Eternal Fortress. Upon hearing of the fortress, Rogel Dawn publicly declared that the Imperial Fists would dig Perturabo out of his hole and bring him back to Terra in an iron cage. Rabute Gilliman pleaded with Dawn to let him help, but just as Perturabo planned, Dawn was arrogant enough to undertake this mission alone. Rogel Dawn expected honourable battle, but that was not Perturabo's agenda at all. The Eternal Fortress was a sophisticated trap. At its centre was a keep sitting in the middle of 20 square miles of bunkers, towers, minefields, trenches, razor wire, tank traps and much more. Radiating out from the keep in the shape of an eight-pointed star were underground tunnels that connected the surface fortifications. Every entrance to the underground network was concealed and the keep itself was a decoy of no real value. Most fortifications are limited by the need to protect something. The Eternal Fortress was just 20 square miles of killing ground. Perturabo and the Iron Warriors waited below the surface for the first shots of the Imperial Fist's orbital barrage. As soon as it commenced, they replied with a number of remote weapon silos located well away from the fortress. 
The 7th Legion responded, with Thunderhawk-born troops attacking the silos and a full combat drop of the rest of the Legion. As soon as the attacks on the silos were underway, the missile stockpiles were detonated. Thousands of tons of debris was hurled into Sebastus's atmosphere, making communication between ground troops and fleet virtually impossible. The detonation was the signal for the Iron Warrior's fleet to attack. The traitor fleet was no stronger than that of Dawn's, but the Loyalist Thunderhawks were on the planet's surface. Also, the Chaos ships had many Iron Warriors amongst their complements eager to man the assault boats. The Imperial Fist's fleet tried to hold, but was forced inexorably out of position. After a few hours, the only target being engaged on the planet were coordinates pre-planned by Perturabo. Under fire from space, the Imperial Fists proceeded with their assault in parade ground formation on a four-company front. Perturabo watched from an observation tower and carefully began to destroy them. First, the minefields did their work. Then, when they reached the first expanse of fortifications, the Iron Warriors manned their trenches and opened fire. While the trenches held the Loyalists' attention, squads of Iron Warriors with crack grenades and melter bombs emerged from hidden bunkers and attacked the tanks halted by the fortifications. The Imperial Fists turned back to fend off this threat and for a time were pinned down amidst the tank traps. Once more they rallied and swept forward to overrun the Iron Warrior trenches, only to find them empty. So it continued. Perturabo dissected the Imperial Fists tank by tank, squad by squad. Rogel Dawn remained convinced that victory was in sight and pushed his men on. Perturabo pulled back some of his defenders and called upon others to hold, a stratagem that had fractured the Imperial Fists, first into companies, then into squads. By day six of the battle, each Marine fought virtually alone and Dawn's troops were reduced to burrowing into the mud and piling up the dead bodies of their brethren for cover. Still, Perturabo remained patient. He allowed Dawn to rampage around the trenches, calling his name and demanding personal combat, content that the sight of their Primarch's impotence would demoralize the Imperial Fists. The siege of the Eternal Fortress was to last for three more weeks. The Imperial Fists had burrowed into the killing zone and were unable to escape. Although his captains called for a breakout, Rogel Dawn would not give the order. He refused to believe the evidence of his eyes and continued to call for one last charge or for Perturabo to face him. Unable to abandon their Primarch, the Imperial Fists prepared to die with him. If Perturabo had a failing, it was that he had grown to enjoy tormenting his enemies too much. He could have finished off the Imperial Fists at any time, but chose not to. Fortunately for Rogel Dawn, Rabute Gilliman put the Imperium before pride and had brought the Ultramarines to the rescue. The powerful Ultramarine fleet forced the Iron Warriors back while their Thunderhawks plunged through dust clouds to evacuate the Imperial Fists. Perturabo had no desire to fight two of his brothers and concentrated on preventing the Imperial Fists evacuating their dead and wounded. Was now a broken man, it would be 19 years before the Imperial Fists could once again go to war. They left over 400 Marines at the Eternal Fortress and every refugee carried horrific wounds. The gene seed captured was sacrificed to the Dark Gods in return for Perturabo's elevation to Demon Prince. One insult had been avenged, and since then, the Iron Warriors have lived only to settle accounts with the corpse on the Golden Throne. So that scene is pretty shocking, really, I think, to imperial fist fans because you're so used to rogel dawn being this incredible figure that doesn't get things wrong and i think this is why we need to talk about 
where the Rogue Dawn has been broken because I think actually annoyingly there was something wrong with the video there. But the wording in the book is very clear and specific that Rogue Dawn after this is now a broken man. But I am not entirely sure that it is just this event that does this. So one of the things that you'll notice in that passage is that Rogel Dawn ignores the pleas of his sons. And he actually, you know, insists on pushing on. And it's just his pride that is forcing him on to fight against his brother. However, if we have a look at the end and the death of Volume 1 and 2, in Volume 1, when he's in the desert, he discovers the plates and bodies of his dead sons, and he grieves immensely. And then in the end and the death of Volume 2, he discovers their bodies again, but for real, in the inevitable city. And he actually picks up this sword of one of his sons and says, I am going to plunge this into the red. He literally wants to go and fight corn at this point. That's how obviously furious he is. And it's very clear that Rogel Dawn is devastated to see his sons absolutely butchered as they were. So to have this follow-up event that has Rogel Dawn ignoring the plight of his sons and, and just pushing on, and as it says, it's it's through pride and arrogance, and he's so confident that he can beat Perturabo. If you're not familiar with their kind of struggle and their rivalry, they have been rivals long before the Horus Heresy into the Great Crusade, and they actually used to like have mock games and, and battles with each other often. And the Iron Warriors even play this game that's basically like Warhammer in the setting. It's genuinely pretty on the nose. And whenever Rogel Dawn and Perturaba used to play any kind of game, it was said that Dawn would always win. So Dawn is so confident that he will beat Perturabo. When Rogel Dawn becomes the Praetorian of Terror, when the Emperor actually asks him, can you reinforce the Imperial Palace? Uh, Rogel Dawn uh, insults Perturabo and says that, 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 you know, if the fortresses are well manned, then there is nothing Perturabo could do. He could never beat my fortresses. And Perturabo rages at this. So he's absolutely furious. And it's a huge 180 because that's that's generally what people think about when they think of the rivalry. It's the fact that Perturabo was the one that was always really angry and Dawn was the one that was always described as being better. But actually... In the Iron Cage, it is brutal and absolutely savage that the Iron Warriors could have just destroyed the Imperial Fists at any time. Whenever they wanted to do so, they could have just done it. But Perturabo enjoyed torturing the Imperial Fists and his brother so much, he just didn't. If Gilliman hadn't come and saved the Imperial Fists, the entire Legion would have been lost. And this event actually causes Perturabo's ascendancy, creating this undivided demon prince. Undivided chaos characters are always incredibly powerful. But Perturabo, whilst he realistically should have been doing more over the last 10,000 years, he has been a pretty big blight on the Imperium. He is the one that is responsible for creating all of the incredible weapons that Abaddon and the other chaos lords use. And, and Rogel Dawn creates that. He does create this, this absolute monster. And in the future of Warhammer 40k, when all the Primarchs and Chaos Primarchs do return, I think you'll see Perturabo coming to huge prominence because, as you've probably heard before, it's often said that Perturabo is the backbone of the traitor forces in the Horus Heresy. And it really is true. It really is true. And it's terrible. So a, a good look for Abute Gilliman in this scene because... If you're not familiar, up until the Iron Cage, Rogel Dawn and Rebute Gilliman had a huge argument. They disagreed greatly over Gilliman's plan to split up the legions into chapters. It's called the Codex Crisis. There was, of course, fear that it might lead to another civil war. It was certainly bad enough that Rogel Dawn refuses the aid of Gilliman in fighting against Perturabo. And if Gilliman hadn't put the Imperium before his pride, the Imperial fists would have been lost. It's a pretty, pretty brutal scene. I have this big theory that what we're seeing now in the End of the Death Volume 2 is the start of the breaking of Rogel Dawn. You know, he has spent three centuries, he kind of thinks, in this desert. 
where he sees the dead bodies of his sons. He's taunted by Corn. He forgets his own name at times, has to remember it and reassert his will. He constantly tries to you know torment Corn at times by repeatedly writing down battle plans and keep coming up with plans on how to escape the, and get over this wall, and he just can't. And then he gets out of this fortress and he's probably going to fight some demons and stuff. And then he finds the you know, the dead body of his father has to rebuild the Imperium, and then he has the Iron Cage. And by the time he gets to the Iron Cage, the actions that we see of Rogal Dawn there, I think, are very different. They don't match up with Rogal Dawn in the Heresy. You know, he, like I say, he gets he's nothing but net through most of the Heresy. He's an incredibly likable character. You know, at the start, he's mean to Nathaniel Garrow. And I suppose I don't like it when people are mean to Nathaniel Garrow, so I didn't like that. But after that, he's a fantastic character and he deals with multiple Primarchs for the traitors and after the Emperor. He's probably the main reason that Terra stands is for as long as it does and allows the Ultramarines to actually make it to the Sol system. So it's a pretty big change. I still don't believe 400 Marines of the Fist were the only casualties of this battle. I wish to know the Legion strength during this battle for both the Fist and the Iron Warrior. That's a really good question. So this event, the Iron Cage, it's referenced occasionally when the Iron Warriors and Imperial Fists fight in the books, for example. But it's not been properly chronicled since like 5th edition. That's the last time it was properly written about. Even in the Imperial Fist Codex, they don't really delve into the Iron Cage. And I think the reason for that is because we might see events of this retconned. One of the things that has changed a lot over the last 20 years are the sizes of the legions and how many casualties, for example, there are in battles. So that 400 number might end up being like a 40,000 number in the future. Although it's worth noting that the Imperial Fists are a much smaller legion after the Siege of Terror. I also think it might just be the case that, and it's tough, I did look into this, it's tough to read from the wording, but I think that 400 number is just like they're going to be the 400 Marines who are left behind by the Imperial Fists and the Ultramarines. They just can't evacuate them. And uh, their gene seed is sacrificed to the Dark Gods. I am really excited to see how they make Perturabo a demon prince. So if you're not familiar, Perturabo kind of hates the chaos by the end of the Horus Heresy. He's very much like aligned with Abaddon's beliefs if you're a Black Legion fan. And he thinks like Horus is an idiot, Horus is a fool. He leaves the siege in protest and he hates what Horus has become. So the idea that he goes from that to becoming a demon prince is a huge change. I should say as well, because people are often unsure, he is definitely a demon prince. So we see him use like gifts of Nurgle in 40k. He does meet Hansao in like a short story. We know for sure he is a demon prince. And a lot of people are not so sure on that. But certainly it does mean that we're going to have to go on this huge, huge plot development to find out how on earth Perturabo, this man who hated chaos, ends up as a demon prince because it just it just doesn't match up as it stands now so that in theory will be a fascinating book in the scouring if we have a side of rogal dawn who ends up you know because at the end of the, the siege of terror rogal dawn is the man you know he is the guy that saved terror he goes from that to the iron cage and perturabo goes from his position of hating chaos to becoming a demon prince that's a lot of character development to have. So, I mean, probably mul multiple books. But Tarabo is a tricky one. He tricked the lion and it looks like he tricked Dawn too. Yeah, I mean, the tricking of the lion, people love to read into that. Like, you got to remember, everyone was tricked. The emperor was tricked by Perturabo during this time. People often like to go, ah, oh, the lion's such an idiot. Nobody guessed Istvan 5 was coming. It's not like the salamanders were like, you know, I think something's up here. They, they all get absolutely blasted. Imperial fists are almost wiped out during the Iron Cage and are basically wiped out during the War of the Beast. They have a rough post heresy. I mean, that is very true. It's a big spoiler, but they, yeah, they are wiped out essentially to a man, the, the chapter of the Imperial Fists during the War of the Beast. And they have to be kind of reformed using Marines from like loads of other Imperial Fist chapters. It's pretty, pretty savage. How do you think they will tie this into Rogel's disappearance? So Rogel's disappearance is very mysterious. Again, that is something that has already been retconned so in the original lore like if you have a look in like the original space marine books it is said that they have rogal dawn's skeleton in amber on the phalanx however in mon 40k lore it said that they only have his fist and the chapter masters like will scrimshaw their names onto the fist 
that's already a pretty big change. There's also a lot of confusion, I think, around that event, kind of understandably, because it's said that Rogaldorn is lost during a Black Crusade. Now, there is this definition of Black Crusade, which is like any large incursion into the, Im the Imperium from the Eye of Terror. However, Abaddon wasn't even attacking the Imperium at that stage. So how did Rogaldorn go missing during a Black Crusade? if Abaddon's not even properly up and up and running at this point in time. Seemingly, it's just some, like, meaningless Black Crusade that takes Rogel Dawn, and, I don't know, it's not a great look. Um, but certainly, again, in terms of Rogel Dawn being broken, it's a pretty good explanation to explain why he abandons the Imperium, and, you know, certainly it seems like he sacrificed himself and more of his sons to save Cadia, essentially, in this final... Uh, confrontation but he does teleport onto the sword of sacrilege and there's really not much evidence that anybody on the chaos side even believes rogal dawn is dead you'd imagine for example that ship the sword of sacrilege being a much bigger thing in the chaos fleets i think the thousand suns have it nowadays and it's not like a centerpiece it's just like a ship they have and there's no Chaos Space Marines who are bragging about the fact that they're the one that killed Rogel Dawn. There's no, you know, people holding up a helmet that looks like Rogel Dawn's helmet and saying this is the real helmet. There's no real attempt to convince us that Rogel Dawn is actually dead. Perturabo was incredibly pragmatic. He probably would have viewed Ascension as essential to victory, potentially. There's definitely this side of falling to chaos that you do see where you get to this point of like, well, what else are we going to do? The Imperium will never take us back. At least there's some sort of happiness to be had. But uh, yeah, maybe. So my idea for how Perturabo would ascend would be that he kind of was experimenting scientifically with chaos and was looking more and more into warp magic because the chaos is on the back foot here, well, the, the traitor forces at least. And so he's like, well, there is this kind of, you know, force of chaos that's clearly very powerful. Maybe he thinks he can master it in a way that Horus never could because his fear is that he'll end up being used like Horus was used. And maybe if he thinks he can kind of scientifically conquer the warp, then he will, you know, then he will be able to beat the Imperium. But at the same time, he ends up kind of being tricked by the Chaos Gods and he ends up ascending kind of uh, as a mistake. So may maybe they'll write it like that and have it such that Pantarabo really didn't want to ascend, but through, through fault, he ends up ascending. You're quickly becoming my favorite 40k YouTuber. Oh, thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate that. There's a lot of amazing lore YouTubers. But... um. Yeah, it's uh, that's always great to read that kind of thing. Wasn't Peter dying from what Fulgrim did to him? Maybe he went to Demon to use Chaos and be the character who actually takes advantage of Chaos. Potentially. Yeah, you, you could do that. You could say it was the, he was dying. He never found a way to beat it. And yeah, yeah. I guess the only thing with that is it kind of, and there's nothing wrong with this, but it kind of runs quite similar to Angron's storyline in a way. Because Angron also was very dying in the... Uh, Logo has him ascend to demonhood to save him. Could Rogel return as a Dreadnought Primarch? That would be amazing. That would be really, really cool. I think one of the other things about Rogel Dawn's return that is a really cool thing to think about, all of the Primarchs at the moment, the, the designers that GW have confirmed, are getting a piece of the Emperor's war gear. So Gilliman has the Emperor's sword. Uh, the Lion has the Emperor's shield. And the question is, what is Rogel Dawn going to get? And there's kind of a process of elimination we can go down. Uh, Rogel Dawn has, uh, Lehman Russ has the spear. The Emperor has a claw, which Rogel Dawn could use potentially over that hand that he's lost on the Sword of Sacrilege. But at the same time, Primarchs are supposed to be able to regrow limbs. So Fulgrim does this during the Heresy, for example, before he becomes a Demon Prince. So maybe he'll just regrow the limb, but him having the claw would work. But I'd quite like to see Corvus have the claw because Corvus loves claws, basically. Um, but you could also give like Corvus maybe like a cloak. Uh, Rogaldorn could have maybe like a big chunk of his armor. That would make sense because he already like, loves, loves the bling, doesn't he? He's a big golden boy. But um, yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting. Uh, Dawn lives, stomp, stomp, of course. 
Uh, it sets up him getting the Empress Claw as his primary. Oh, there we go. Uh, as his primary weapon if he returns because his hand is gone. Yeah, I mean the, the claw would make sense. I think I just quite like I quite like the idea in my head of Corvus Corax coming back, being this big shadow monster, and he has one black claw and then one golden claw. I think that would just be awesome. I just I think that'd be really cool. But um, yeah, I guess you could probably be cheeky with it and give like you could give Corvus like the Emperor's cloak or something like that, but. Corvus can't really get any more invisible. <laughs> He's already invisible enough. But although the other thing that's really interesting, sorry, just spitballing, the Loyalist Primarchs, we think, or well, I think, will probably have started experimenting more and more with the warp. So Corvus is the best example because we see him fight Lorgar in the book uh, Shadows of the Past, and he has incredible psychic power in there. But also, I'd imagine someone like Lehman Russ will see come back and he'll have like various kind of uh, thunder powers, etc. Like, kind of like Thor to Odin, o Thor to Odin transition will be complete. And I'd quite like to see a, a bunch of the Primarchs messing around with psychic powers. And so, potentially, they could get gifts from the Emperor's armory that enhance their psychic abilities. That could be pretty cool. So, you could go that way as well. Sorry, that's a really fun topic. I totally just have to stream about that one day, maybe. Um, uh, Perturabo will be a Chaos Red nor of immense proportions, I think. I think I'd, I'd like to see Perturabo as a massive metal dragon. I think it's kind of like the ultimate demon engine. That's how I imagine Perturabo. But... Yeah, I don't know. I, I always think of him like a massive metal dragon. There is like a very, very vague description of him uh, in a short story, but it could be like anything. He's just like, he's a demon and he's Lord of Iron. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely metal involved. It is interesting. Another thing to note is that in The Beast Arises, Vulcan does say that he'll speak, uh, he'll let Dawn know about his incredible sons. And so it's very much implied that Dawn and Vulcan are potentially in talks during uh, during at least the kind of 32nd millennium. So maybe Dawn and Vulcan are hanging out. I've also quite liked the idea that maybe Vulcan... Oh, sorry, that, that I've also quite liked the idea that maybe Dawn is in the throne room. So maybe he has felt so guilty about the the interment of the emperor he actually watches over dawn from the throne room and that would kind of make sense because no one goes in there if you got most people if they go in there they die and you just have to ask the custodians to be quiet about it and they probably will be so i think that kind of makes sense uh and if that's the case then in theory gilliman and vulcan or whoever might have already met with dawn so it'd be pretty cool i hope chaos perturabo model has hooves you hope he's a Tau. Interesting. Oh, that would be a hell of a change. I agree that uh, Barabas Antioch and Alexis Pollock show exactly how close Dawn and part of Perturabo would have been if they put their differences aside. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Perturabo is one of those Primarchs that I kind of get it. You know, he, he's childish in a lot of ways and he's a ridiculously short temper. But at the same time, he gets horrible jobs from the Emperor. The uh, campaign against the Hrud. It's just brutal. Like, no one would want... That's, like, the worst war you could possibly fight. They'd have, like, time stop, time slowing powers. And so all of these all of these iron warriors end up aging so much. That's why Dantioch is quite old and frail by the time we see him in the Horus Heresy. It's, it's pretty brutal. Talk about the greatness of Vulcan or I'm leaving. <laughs> uh, I mean, Vulcan is a, a very likable character. I mean, this is the thing. Like, Vulcan... Comparing Vulcan and Dawn's storyline, for example, is pretty savage. Vulcan and Corvus Corax get a really hard time in the Heresy. Like it's just brutal. It's not just Istvan Five. Istvan Five or three? Yeah, Istvan Five. Afterwards, like you know, Vulcan gets tortured. Corvus tries to rebuild his legion, and it goes horrifically wrong. He has to slaughter his own sons. It's just savage. Whereas Rogue or Dawn is just like you know, ah. Oh, he finds Gara. He goes to Terra. He does, he's, uh, you know, he re, uh, fortifies the Imperial Palace. He beats Alpharius. He leads them during the Siege of Terra. He delays them for a huge period of time. He beats uh, Fulgrim. It's just incredible, incredible win after win after win. He anticipates what the Tracers are going to do. It, it just is brutal. So it's, I, I honestly would expect to see Rogaldorn get 
a real hard time in the iron cage i'm afraid to say because it, it, it there's some sort of balancing out here that has to happen um you know like we've seen i mean gilliman technically doesn't doesn't lose too much but he does kind of die to be fair uh, didn't the Emperor also have a power fist? He used it to knock out Lehman Russ. So maybe Dawn could give that. I mean, the Emperor would have a massive library. I think I think what they mean when they say we'll get a piece of the Emperor's armor is in that classic, is those classical pictures of the Emperor fighting on the vengeful spirit. All of the Primarchs get a piece of that war gear. That's what I'd guess. But in, th in theory, yes, the Emperor has this massive library and he, he can give them all 20 suits of armor each. He's probably got them fine. I hope Dawn gets the claw and Vulcan the gauntlet modified into a power fist. I mean, that's true. Yeah, I guess you can kind of change the size of things like uh, the shield. The shield was a really clever, it was a clever idea. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's broken <laughs> as well. In, in the, it's completely, like the, if you haven't read Arcs of Omen, in like the previous book, Angron, Angron, like, he finds the sweet spot, but he destroys a planet with one of his blows. And there's like Korn's power behind this blow. And then lions just like shrugging them off, sending Angron flying off. Do you think if Dawn is alive and in the warp, he will have mutated, evolved like Corvus? If so, what would he be? I don't think they would have done that for Dawn. I think there's a chance you'd see that for Lehman Russ. And you'll see like a, a very odin -y Lehman Russ. That's what I would guess you'll see. That's why he's got the spear. He's described as being very old, like the lion in his Primark novel when he finally leaves. And I think you'll see him with some sort of like warp lightning powers. That's my guess. But that's it for this stream. Thank you so much for watching. If you do enjoy this content, please do click the like button. You can subscribe to the channel. You can join the channel by clicking the join button on the page below. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.